Um, so, for example, giving a client telephone numbers, et cetera, et cetera, is not covered by the privilege, um, as well as it's, if it's not the, if it doesn't go into the uh, substance of the representation, it is not covered under cases such as State versus Davis. Um, the code is, of course, talks about um, back and forth, so it covers its reciprocal communications between the defendant and his lawyer and vice versa. And um, the purpose is to encourage frank disclosure by client to lawyer without the fear of subsequent disclosure. And I can I agree that the fact that the uh, individual, in this case, Mr. Dulos, is deceased, does not in any way waive the privilege any more than a psychiatric privilege is waived by the death of the patient in that case. Um, so I'm not sure what the uh, extent is of the concern regarding the testimony. Um, Mr. Rose, Attorney Rose, is not testifying today. He's not scheduled to testify today. Um, and he's going to only be testifying the events time-wise surrounding the production and the review of certain documents, particularly the Dr. Herman report by Mr. Uh, Dulos and Mr. Rose, without getting into their communications, Your Honor, recall that Attorney Meehan was called by the state, and he was allowed to testify to certain reactions, certain um, um, comments made in his presence uh, with Mr. Rose present. So I'm just going to indicate that to the extent that that matter is going to be covered, it's no further. It's the same limitations as was presented with Attorney me and, and his testimony. I also want to correct one um, statement. I'm not sure that Attorney Jennings was aware. The family court matter, the only thing that was sealed was the two court appearances on May 14th and May 17th, 2019, and the transcript and the uh, discussion of what happened there, as well as the sealing of the uh, report, Dr. Herman's report. Everything else remains, well, unless it's been destroyed by now, but remain in the public record. I was able to get a complete copy of documents from the court clerk's office of every pleading going back. Other transcripts were available, uh, had been prepared um, and, and disseminated. So I'm aware of the court's uh, restrictions. I had no intention of going to that. I have no intention of going into any of the, of the um, uh, substance of communications between attorney Rose and Mr. Dulos, and of course that would not cover communications that Mr. Rose had with my client, which I intend to uh, elicit to a small degree there were communications with my client directly by attorney Rose. So I think that based on that, that should eliminate any concern raised by Mr. Jennings, and I will note uh, when I presented what I intended to get into with Mr. Ment, he also agreed with me that he did not see that that would fall within the uh, purview, but to be safe, he wanted to make sure that the court understood that the privilege was still in effect. And I fully, not only do I accept that, I fully agree with that as an important concept. Thank you. The court is not inclined to grant the motion to quash what the court will require, though, Attorney Jennings, you may approach the podium. Uh, the motion uh, requests that this court issue an order quashing the defendant's subpoena or otherwise limiting the scope of any compelled testimony through an appropriately tailored protective order. The court would require a protective order drafted by your office to be considered. Uh, it is not the court's role to draft its own protective order on behalf of any party. So if that can be filed today, uh, the court will take that up uh, probably tomorrow. The court does not know when uh, Attorney Rose is scheduled to testify, but the court will consider taking up a protective order which the court may grant, deny, or modify. And that should be uh, filed by the close of business today. 
Yes, Your Honor, and I will, um, I will speak with uh, defense counsel. I know my partner, Mr. Ment, already has um, and try to tailor any protective order to the content that counsel seeks to elicit from Mr. Rose. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are still 10 minutes ahead of schedule, so we'll take our 10 minute uh, break until 10 o'clock and then we'll start the proceeding. Thank you. All rise. This honorable speaker for the
Oh, would counsel stipulate, please? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we continue with the state case. Yes, Your Honor. The state would call Gloria Farber to the stand, please. Mrs. Farber, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at the clerk. Hello, Thank raise you. the right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, if you so help me God. Thank you. Um, if you could state your name and then spell it for the record. Gloria Farber. And spell it. Pardon? You could spell your name. G L O R I A. F Frank Frank A R B E R. Thank you. Ms. Farber, you may be seated. Good morning, Mrs. Barber. How are Good you? Good morning. Fine, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Barber, uh, may I call you Gloria? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gloria, how are you related to Jennifer Farber? Do she was my daughter. Okay. How old are you, Gloria, if you don't mind my asking? 88. Okay. And uh, where do you live? I live in New York City. When was uh, your daughter's Jennifer Farber? Yes. Okay, when was Jennifer born? She was born September 27th, 1968. How many children did Jennifer have? Five. And what are their names? Uh, Petros, Theodore, Christian, Constantine, and Noah. How old was Jennifer in May of 2019? 50. Now, in the time before May 24th, 2019, did you see your daughter often? Yes. Did you speak to her often? Yes. Did you see your grandchildren often? Yes. Now, on May 24th, 
of 2019. Did you have plans to see Jennifer? Yes, I did. What were those plans? Well, she was going to meet us at my apartment. Is that in the city? In the city, in New York City. And were the children coming as well? Yes, they were. And did the children show up at your apartment that day? Yes, they did. Who brought them? Um, Lauren Almeida. Now, was Jennifer supposed to come to your apartment to meet you and the children there? Yes. Did Jennifer show up at your apartment that day? No. Have you seen your daughter Jennifer since she failed to meet you at your apartment in New York City on May 24th, 2019? No. Have you spoken to her on the phone since that no, day? No, I have not. Have you gotten any emails or text messages or any communication from your daughter since that no. day? No. I'm sorry, you have to speak up. Before. No. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jennifer's five children, uh, when was the oldest one born? Uh, April 20th, um, 2006, so by you, four minutes, because two, they're twins. So oh. the oldest one is Petros. So there's four minutes apart between so, Petros and Theodore. So the oldest by four minutes? Yes. Okay. In 2006? Yes. Between 2006 and 2019, did Jennifer ever miss one of her children's birthdays? Never. And uh, and the children celebrate their name days, right, under the Greek culture? Yes, they did. Did Jennifer ever miss a name day between 2006 and 2019? Yes. Was she always there for them? Pardon? Was Jennifer always there for them? Yes, she was always there. And uh, as of now, uh, 2024, do you have custody of the five children? I do. And since May 24th, uh, 2019, have any of the children ever seen or spoken to their mother? No. I have nothing further. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning, Mrs. Barber. Good morning. I just have a few questions for you, if I may. Can you hear me OK? I do. Was. Um, Jennifer's plan to come to New York by herself or with the children? By herself, because she dropped the children off at the New Canaan Country Day School. And the children uh, did come with Lauren to New York that day to, yes. to your apartment? Yes. Were they there at about 12 or 1 in the afternoon? I'd say about 12 or 1, yes. Did you uh, reach out by telephone to uh, Jennifer the day before she came to New York. Objection. Ground. Outside the scope, Your Honor. It is outside of the scope. Well, it's a preliminary to the plans of her coming to New York, Your Honor. Well, uh, the objection is sustained, but you can continue with the line of questioning. Did you make plans with Jennifer to um, have her come to New York the next day? Did she share that with you? Yes, she did. Did she mention she was first going to a doctor's appointment that morning? Objection, Your Honor. Well, the court allowed the question concerning plans, and so this is a follow-up on plans overruled. Do you remember the question, ma'am? Did she have plans to visit a doctor? Before she came to your apartment? Yes. Do you remember if it was a Dr. Geronimus that she was going to see that Yes. Morning? And did you, um, as part of your making plans with her, did you try to call her the day before to confirm those plans in the afternoon? Objection, Your Honor. Well, now the line of questioning goes from what was the plan to did you try to confirm the plan? And so the court is going to sustain the objection. Did you speak at all to Jennifer that morning of the 24th? No. Did you call, did you call her on her cell phone? No. Objection, Your Honor. 
Well, the answer to the question was, did you speak to Jennifer that morning? The answer was no. And the court understands the second question to be, did you attempt to contact her that morning? You may ask the question again, Tom. Did you attempt to, to contact her that morning? No. Did you have her phone number at the time? Of course. Do you recall what that number is today? Objection, Your Honor. Sustain. I have no further questions. I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Barber, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you. State rest, Your Honor. So, ladies and gentlemen, what that means is the state at this time rests its case. The state, if the defense puts on witnesses, the state has an opportunity, if it so chooses, to present rebuttal witnesses. But as of right now, the state rests its case. The court has to take up at this point legal arguments. And if the defense has witnesses ready to be called after those legal arguments, we will resume the session. So please do not discuss the case. And we probably are going to be in a much longer recess than normal. Are there defense witnesses ready for today, Attorney Sean? Yes, Your Honor. Are they ready this morning? Um, we were instruct. We were informed that the they would arrive by eleven. We didn't know how long the uh, state's case would take. Thank you. So we'll stand in our recess, uh, ladies and gentlemen, until eleven o'clock. Defense has an opportunity to argue its motion for judgment of acquittal. That motion was filed yesterday, February 20th. Yes, and I'll note that originally we thought the state would complete yesterday. So even though it's dated yesterday, it's to take effect at this point now that the state has rested. Thank you. Um, I move to uh, for the court to grant the judgment of acquittal on each of the uh, present charges, each count separately, and I will just go through each of them. The state has um, presented, and again, the, the standard for a motion for judgment of acquittal, is there any evidence that, a, that the jury could find beyond a reasonable doubt that the state has met its burden on each and every element of the offense charge. Let me just begin where I will concede that there is sufficient evidence of certain elements that would have to be resolved by the uh, jury. So for example, I believe the state has been able to show that a jury could find that Jennifer Dulos is deceased. We would also concede from, for again, for purposes of this motion, that the uh, death of Miss of Miss Farber Dulos was either induced by or caused by Fotis Dulos, either directly or indirectly. What I submit that the state has failed to establish is whether the that death <coughs> was caused by the specific under the common law, we call malice aforethought, which means intentional 
uh, killing of another individual under the um, statute providing for the elements of murder. That, however, even if the state could do that, even if the state can argue that there's sufficient evidence to show that Fotis Dulos planned the outcome that occurred, we have to also remember, Your Honor, that much of the state's evidence is based on this presumptive testing, which I note under State versus Moody, in and of itself fails to provide any evidentiary value whatsoever. So even though the jury and the court hasn't yet fully instructed the jury, the, the court made some comment to the jury about what it's allowed for. But Luminol and uh, Castle Meyer are not evidence of blood. So the fact that there's been a lot of testimony about that, it's in the interrogation videos. It was the sub subject of many witnesses' testimony. It does not provide any basis for the court or for any fact finder to determine that that was, in fact, blood. And for reasons that we still don't know, the only three, there were only three items that were tested. And we concede one of them being the shirt and the other being the, um, the bra. Um, and I forget what the third one is right now. But there was one other place where they did test. Uh, and it was determined to actually be not just a blood-like substance or something that tested uh, under a presumptive test, but was, in fact, blood. The um, problem with the state's theory of this case, and as it was presented, is that the state spent a month or more trying to prove that Fotis Dulos killed his wife. None of that, however, none of that evidence pointed to Ms. Traconis as being a party to that plan, that design, or the acts involving the of the death itself or this, the cover-up afterwards, I would readily concede that the court proved that Fotis Dulos was involved in the covering up of a crime. Whether that crime was murder, as the state alleges, or some other crime, again, the way it's been charged, that it could only be murder. It cannot be manslaughter. It cannot be a, a reckless death. Uh, during a fight or a struggle, it has to be murder because that's the way the state charged this uh, offense under count one. In fact, the way they charged it is they say that Fotis Dulos, quote, did assault Jennifer Farber Dulos in her home on the 24th day of May 2019 with the intent to restrain and kill her in violation of sections 53A, 48A, and 53A, 54A, subsection A. I will note there has been no evidence from any source of any restraint. But let's just assume that there's still enough uh, uh, to at least allege that there was an intent to kill, even if I submit the evidence doesn't support that. But now we get to the question in count one of conspiracy. Under our law, under Connecticut General Statute uh, 48A, the, um, the state must demonstrate essentially uh, four things. One being the underlying purpose being to restrain and kill Jennifer Dolos. The first question is they have to prove that Michelle Traconis intended to commit that crime, the specific crime of murder. Two that there was an agreement between Michelle Traconis and Fotis Dulos to commit that crime of murder. Three, that the specific intent was to restrain and or kill, and kill, not or, uh, Jennifer Dulos. And four, the, uh, it, there was an actual agreement to do those things together. Now, the state has alleged uh, that the defendant agreed with other persons, quote unquote, to engage in these crimes. The state was not required to, act, to actually place in their information who those other people were. We've heard the names of possible other individuals. There was Kent Mawinney, 
Uh, there was Andreas Tutsiardis. There was even Pavel Gumieni as people that may have committed acts that might be considered certainly suspicious, but the state made no effort to demonstrate that Michelle Turconis agreed with any of them to commit an offense. I now want to just talk about the count. Basically, I'm going to not repeat what I'm saying about the crime of conspiracy, other than conspiracy is a specific intent crime. Not only do you have to prove the underlying elements that the defendant was involved in, but that she had a specific <coughs> intent to agree to commit those offenses in advance. And if one looks at the, and, and I'll start with then with count two. Count two specifically alleges that Michelle Traconis entered into a conspiracy on 24th of May, 2019 in the area of Albany Avenue in Hartford to commit the crime of tampering with physical evidence with the intent that conduct constituting the, that crime be performed and did agree with Fotis Doulos to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct. And one of them, I would submit the only other one is Fotis Doulos, did commit an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. It goes on to say that Michelle Traconis traveled with Fotis Doulos to the Harvard area for the purpose of disposal, disposal of physical evidence relating to the murder of Jennifer Farber Doulos in Hartford on May 24, 2019. That's the allegation that's been submitted. I submit there is no knowledge, no evidence whatsoever that Michelle Traconis either agreed to do that or had any idea what was going on, what Mr. Doulos was doing. We've spent, I don't know how many hours of, uh, of interrogation video. She never, so, so we start with the fact she said absolutely nothing that would constitute admission to any knowledge of that. To the contrary, she repeatedly, over the course of months, denied any knowledge as to what Doulos was up to. So what, are we, what is the evidence with regard to that? We do know, let's work backwards, the police did not come to the home of, of um, Doulos and Mr. Conus until eight, approximately 8.30 the night of May 24, 2019. The testimony is they came to the house and told uh, Mr. Doulos, and my client heard part of this, that Jennifer Doulos was missing. This, of course, is after they were in Hartford at, at, on Albany Avenue. So we have black garbage bags, opaque garbage bags. We see Mr. Doulos placing them in various receptacles. Only one of them, incidentally, contained any items of evidentiary value to this case, the ones where the, the two garbage bags, the, the, the shirt, the bra, number of other items that were found with blood on them, but they weren't in garbage bags. It was spread among whatever trash was in that barrel. But be that as it may, the evidence is uncontested that it was Fotis Doulos who got out, took the garbage, and threw them in those uh, barrels. This is prior to the, any time that Michelle Traconis would even know that there was a, um, uh, a crime that may have occurred and that there was an investigation that was beginning. So in order to be guilty of tampering with physical evidence, it specifically requires under the statute that believe, under um, 53A-155 that the defendant would have to believe that a criminal investigation conducted by law enforcement or an, uh, is pending or about to be instituted. And, there, and it claims that she either destroyed, concealed, or removed anything for the purpose of impairing its ability uh, to be used in the criminal investigation. Again, the only evidence is that she only even learned that there was an investigation afterwards at 8.30 at night after they had been to Albany Avenue, after they'd been to Starbucks, and then they went home. So I submit that there is zero evidence in the record to allow any reasonable trier of fact, any, to conclude that she engaged in that conduct or agreed in advance to that conduct, uh, either substantively or in a conspiracy 
to commit that crime in the absence of any evidence that she knew there was a criminal investigation uh, at all or that even one was being uh, instituted. If I may um, move on. I will also note, Your Honor, that uh, there's a lot of cases that specifically say that um, mere presence or even acquiescence in the conduct of uh, someone else is not evidence of a crime. And a jury has to be instructed that that cannot be used as the basis. There has to actually be affirmative evidence. Merely being present under our law is not a basis to uh, convict anyone of any crime, even if they're sitting there while someone else is engaged in activity, in obvious activity in their presence. Um, count three is the substantive offense of tampering with physical evidence, again under 53A, 155A1. It is charged as accessory under 53A-8. I note that under our law, the crime of ex accessory and the principal crime are the same. They are two manners of committing the same crime. But the way it's been charged here, it indicates that um, simply that she committed the substantive crime. I guess there is zero evidence that she did that. She didn't touch anything that's connected to a crime in the city of Hartford on May 24th, 2019. I will note, Your Honor, there is, I'm anticipating what the state's going to say, well, there were three cells of partial DNA of Mr. Conus found on the exterior of the of the um, opening of the bag, so the place where you would hold it, you grab a bag, might pull it out of a of a um, box, but it was partial, and the state did not test either Mr. Cronus's mother or her daughter, who also lived in the home. Even if they can assume that these garbage bags came from that box of trash of trash bags <coughs> that was seized from the home itself. There's an interesting recent Connecticut Supreme Court case on this that Your Honor should be at least uh, aware of that I want to cite. State versus Dawson at 340 Connecticut, 136, 2021. That is a case where there was a, um, a firearm uh, discovered where there were in the immediate vicinity of three or four individuals. And the Supreme Court in that case ruled in 2021 that DNA evidence standing alone does not establish that a defendant had dominion or control over that weapon. So they reversed the conviction saying the presence of DNA, and they went into this issue of um, partial DNA, the number of picograms, uh, the idea of transfer DNA. They say that is not enough to convict anybody. And I submit that that is precisely where we're going with this particular uh, case here, and the suggestion that three cells that are a partial match to Mr. Conus cannot be the basis for such a finding with regard to that charge. Now let's move then to counts four, five, and six, which all relate to uh, the Russell Speeder, Speeder car wash in, um, in Avon, which is where the state alleges. So we're talking about the, not we're talking about what happened in Mountain Spring Road, that is not the charge. The fact that Mr. Dulos handed Ms. Traconis a, uh, a paper towel that did not smell like anything that she put in a garbage bag is not what they're charging here. It's according to the, uh, the way this case was charged, it, was, it says that she, um, that she both tampered with and hindered the prosecution by did agree with Fotis Dulos by transporting transporting the 2001 Toyota Tacoma used in the commission of the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos to Russell Speeder's car wash for the purpose of having evidence relating to that murder concealed and destroyed. The count five tampering specifically indi in, uh, indicates that believing that the criminal investigation was pending or about to be instituted, altered 
destroyed, concealed, or removed a thing with the purpose of impairing its availability in the criminal investigation. And finally, under hindering, did render criminal assistance, as that is defined, to another person um, that, that she believed committed a murder. I mean, it specifically committed a class A felony to wit murder, did provide Fotostoulis with transportation and other means of avoiding discovery and apprehension. Well, even that is baseless here, Your Honor, because she did not provide transportation to Mr. Dulos to bring the vehicle there. The only testimony is that she followed outside in a separate vehicle, I guess on May 29th, which is what the allegations are here, uh, and then picked him up at the car wash. The only reasonable interpretation is she was somewhere outside, not even visible. He had to call her on the phone to come get him. And of course, this is after the vehicle has been brought in. And she, then the testimony is, they then together drove down to Attorney Bowman's office in Westport. And then when he came back, we had the video. Mr. Dulos obtained some cash and went inside and paid for the detailing after it was done. There is no evidence that Mr. Conus had anything to do with that. There's no evidence that she had any uh, involvement in that bank account, that, it had, that she even would have known what he was taking out and for what purpose. He went in alone to have the car detailed and washed. He alone went in to have it, uh, to pay for it after the fact. And I just want to also clarify because, you know, it, it took a little bit so we got Detective Clavy yesterday to admit it. I'm sorry, Detective uh, Kimball to admit it. But even Mr. Dulles <coughs> did not falsely give information about the Toyota Tacoma to the aide that, in fact, the, uh, the employee had mistakenly written the phone number on the line of a vehicle that came at 844 in the morning and then rewrote it on the line below where it didn't indicate the name of the person who was bringing in that vehicle. So um, I, you know, I, I don't need to repeat. You know, For each of the crimes, you have the same elements for hindering. It requires, all require specific intent. Um, they have to specifically show that the purpose was to commit a, a specifically a crime, a class A or B felony, that she had to be aware of that. Uh, in this case, it had to be uh, by the way the case was charged, murder, not any other crime, not any other crime. There's just one other, and I'll note when I refer to the log sheet, Your Honor, I'm referring to State's Exhibit 138, the Russell Speeder um, log that was introduced and in which um, I showed as well to Mr. Kimball yesterday. So I just want to have a moment. I know that, and I'm just going to say this for the record, um, I know that Judge Blowey denied this, but I want to incorporate my arguments about vicinage and venue for my judgment of acquittal in the case that vicinage is a requirement of the uh, location of the crime, and that um, all of these crimes, all of them, including the conspiracy, all occurred in the Hartford Judicial District I stated for the record, I'm not asking uh, the court, well, I would ask the court to, I don't want the record to suggest that I've waived the issue. So I raise it now so that the court is aware uh, that I'm making that also part of my judgment of acquittal argument um, at this time. Let me just look at my notes for a moment, Your Honor. Oh, um, when I made the comment about um, mere presence as an act, inactive companion, passive acquiescence, or the doing of innocent acts, which may in fact aid the one who commits the crime, must be distinguished from the criminal intent and community of unlawful purpose shared by one who knowingly and willfully assists the perpetrator of the offense in the acts which prepare for, facilitate, or consummate it. Um, that's from uh, State versus Anano, which goes back to 96 Connecticut 420. It's also uh, cited in um, 
State versus Pundy, P-U-N-D-Y, at 147 Connecticut 7, where the court went on to say that uh, those who simply are companions in passive acquiescence uh, may be said to be innocent of any wrongdoing. Just want to check my notes one more time. I'm just going to mention in case the state, instead of standing up a second time, I'm going to just mention Pinkerton liability in case that's one of the state's arguments. That doesn't apply here. And I uh, will note that um, under, the, under Pinkerton, such cases as State versus Bennett at 307 Connecticut 758, which cites to the Pinkerton decision at 328 U.S. 640, um, require a community of criminal intent and community of unlawful purpose with the perpetrator of the crime and must be knowingly and willfully done to assist the perpetrator in the acts which prepare for, facilitate, or consummate it. Uh, under those cases, Your Honor, and there's um, numerous cases that now deal with state, uh, the Pinkerton liability, <coughs> that applies when if somebody is going to rob a bank and they conspire in advance to rob the bank, and there's evidence of that conspiracy, but one of the co-conspirators pulls out a gun and either shoots someone or at least threatens the gun, the co-conspirator can say, well, I didn't know he had a weapon. But under Pinkerton liability, if it's within the furtherance and it can be um, believed to be a likely alternative or outcome, that that could happen if you're going to rob a bank, there's, a, there's an inference that it may be probable somebody may be armed. You can be held liable to the more, ex, uh, what's the best way to put this, to the enhanced penalties or the aggravated fact, aggravating factor that would be contemplated within the crime accused. But you have to go back to knowing what was happening in the first place. If you go to the bank, for example, to make a deposit and the person you're with robs the bank, pulls out a gun and robs the bank. If there's no evidence of an agreement, you're there just to make a deposit. That could not then subject the person to Pinkerton liability merely because uh, he or she was present. In other words, it doesn't shift that liability and, and do away with the requirement of, of concert and uh, concerted effort and, and uh, uh, agreement to commit the crime. Well, the touchstone of Pinkerton is foreseeability, correct? I'm sorry, Your Honor? The touchstone of Pinkerton is foreseeability. Foreseeability, yes, Your Honor. And of course, uh, and I also, when I read Pinkerton, it's not only just foreseeability that one of the people will do something else, but you are already committing a crime. Um, it is not foreseeable that if you go into the bank, a friend of yours may commit a robbery. It's that you agreed in advance. It's just that it's foreseeable that maybe that other person that you already agreed to commit the crime with did something more egregious than simply ask for money and hand up a note. So it's, it's, that's the claim that I'm making with regard to that. There was just one other point, Your Honor, um, that I wanted to make before I sit down. I'm just going to ask the court, there are a couple other cases that have come out that I wanted the court to look at on the issue of uh, in, under um, with uh, tampering, for example. And they are State versus um, Knox, K-N-O-X, 201 Connecticut, uh, Appellate 457 in 2021, and they talk about um, State versus Jordan, which is in 2014, 314 Connecticut, 354. They talk about that the, that's where it specifically says, even though the statute is not as clear, that you had to have acted with the intent to prevent the use of the evidence at an official proceeding or criminal investigation. And it, uh, construes in that respect the difference between that case and State versus Forshaw, F-O-R-E-S-H-A-W, at 214 Connecticut 540, where there was some debate between whether it was a requirement or not. 
And I submit the Jordan case and then the Knox case make that clear. I also want to make one other last argument here. There is going to be some evidence suggested by the state that if Ms. Traconis made false statements or intentionally made false statements, which of course we dispute, but let's assume that based on the testimony, the jury could find that she made false statements during the interrogations. That evidence, Your Honor, was admitted for purposes of um, arguably consciousness of guilt. And we will be submitting a jury instruction that they have to first find that it was intentionally false as opposed to um, um, based on either mistake, misremembering, being coerced, all those things that we've talked about. But the case law on consciousness of guilt makes clear, and the judge must instruct the jury, that consciousness of guilt is not evidence of the crime itself. So they would have, the state would have to prove separately that the defendant, that there was sufficient element of the crime in each element of the crime, and then apply whether, I'll use flight as the example. If a person runs away when the police come and somewhere in a group of people they find drugs, that fact of somebody running away is not evidence that the individual possessed those drugs or possessed it with the intent to sell. It's admissible to show a guilty conscience. And that would only be admissible if there was separately sufficient evidence of the underlying crime beyond a reasonable doubt or crimes. Just one moment, Your Honor. Oh, the other case on Pinkerton that I wanted to cite was um, State versus Patel, which is the uh, appellate court case, 194 Con App 245, 2019. And then uh, I'll also cite to the elements for conspiracy to commit murder, State versus Balbuena, B-A-L-B-U-E-N-A which is um, 168 Con App 194, 2016. And um, Conspiracy to Murder State versus Pinnock, P-I-N-N-O-C-K, at 220 Connecticut 765. Based on that, Your Honor, I ask that on each of the counts, I'm sorry, I I thought it was done. I realized one other thing. There are three separate conspiracy charges charged here. I submit that the state has not shown any three separate agreements under any theory. And at the very minimum, the court is required, based on the evidence, to grant the judgment of acquittal as to two of them. And uh, the way I understand the law, the court can leave in the most serious one, which would be the conspiracy to commit murder if the court does not agree with my other arguments. But the court must, based on the, uh, on the case law, on the issue of, do, of multiplicity of charges, they have not shown there were separate conspiracies at any time. They haven't shown any conspiracies at all. But they certainly haven't shown there are separate conspiracies. And based on all of that, Your Honor, I ask specifically, just on this last argument, that the court grant the uh, judgment of acquittal as to count two, count four as a separate argument. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Your Honor, good morning, and may it please the court. Your Honor, the uh, defendant's argument seems to be that we have a different interpretation of the evidence and therefore grant us an acquittal. But of course, as the court knows, that is not the standard that the court needs to apply here. The court has to view the evidence in a light most favorable to the state as part of this motion, including drawing all reasonable inferences that a jury could find in favor of guilt. Thank you. Including drawing all reasonable inferences that a jury could find in making a finding of guilt. So I want to just begin with uh, the argument that the state has proven that Mr. Dulos is responsible for Jennifer Dulos's death, but that somehow the state has not presented sufficient evidence for a jury to find that uh, it was actually an intentional killing. Um, that is completely belied by the facts of this case, Your Honor. The, a reasonable jury can draw the following inferences. 
Number one, <clears throat> Mr. Dulos was motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos based on the fact that they were involved in a highly contentious divorce. Mr. Dulos drove his employee's Toyota Tacoma to New Canaan to commit this crime. He attacked Jennifer Dulos in her, in her garage and killed her with at least two blows. It's been about a month, but you'll recall, Judge, we had the blood pattern expert who came in and indicated that there were at least two blows which were delivered in this case based on the direction of the blood pattern. By the way, the fact that he was in New Canaan in the first instance, Your Honor, is evidence of his intent because he had no reason to be down there. The children did not have visitation on that day, and um, the fact that he went down there in the first instance is evidence of his intent, including the fact that he took his employee's vehicle. State versus Moody um, does not stand for the proposition that the defense keeps citing. State versus Moody, or I know the court knows this, but it's the totality of the evidence in this case that is the dispositive factor, including the fact that all of those presumptive blood tests subsequently tested positive for Jennifer Dulos's blood. So that's the, um, the compelling factor in this particular instance. A reasonable jury can also find that Jennifer Dulos was transported from her home by Mr. Dulos and her body was disposed of in some manner, which again goes to the intent in committing the crime in the first instance. A reasonable jury can find that her clothing was removed by Mr. Dulos and disposed of in the trash in Albany Avenue, thus demonstrating his connection to the blood, the clothing, and his act of murder. And I would just cite the court to State versus Richards, 196, Con App 387. The state does not need to prove the cause of death in a murder case merely that it was proved, merely that it was caused by criminal means. So in other words, the fact that the body has not been recovered um, does not mean that a jury can't find that there was homicidal violence in this case, particularly when you combine the blood pattern evidence with the cut clothing, with the, uh, the fact of animus towards Jennifer Dulos and Mr. Dulos's DNA in a mixture of blood with Jennifer Dulos's DNA on that faucet. Now, counsel will say, well, there was no confirmatory test done. That's not the test. It's not whether or not a confirmatory test was done. The test is whether or not a reasonable jury could find so here you have Mr. Dulos's DNA mixed on the faucet with Jennifer Dulos's DNA. It's a blood-like stain that tests positive for blood, which is strong evidence of his guilt. Now, that is, of course, evidence of Mr. Dulos's intent, but let's talk about the evidence of the defendant's intent. I would direct the court to State versus Soyini, 180 Con App 205. That was a conspiracy to commit murder case, and, and the court in Soyini specifically talked about one of the factors, uh, of course, for a jury to consider is whether or not somebody who is alleged to have entered into a conspiracy would have been motivated to enter into that conspiracy. So let's talk about all the evidence of the defendant's motive that the state has established during the course of this case. And I would just note also that um, there is no requirement in a conspiracy case that the state present a witness who comes in and says, I agreed or I heard an agreement it can absolutely be proven by circumstantial evidence based on the fact that conspiracies by their very nature are done in secret. And there's a whole line of cases, Your Honor, that stand for that proposition. So the evidence of the defendant's motive here, obviously, number one, her boyfriend is in a contentious divorce with Jennifer Dulos at the time. In part, incidentally, due to the fact that the defendant and Mr. Dulos had an affair and Jennifer Dulos left the house shortly thereafter with the children. They were in a custody battle that necessitated the defendant having to leave the home whenever Mr. Dulos had visitation. She was not to be allowed around the children. During her interview, the defendant actually said that this had been two years of torture. She talked about applying for a restraining order against Ms. Dulos. She discussed the fact that her relationship with Mr. Dulos was suffering as a result and in fact, the defendant told Mike Meehan that she had not moved to Connecticut for this. The defendant also told investigators that she was prepared to leave Mr. Dulos as early as two, December 2018, and the jury can infer that she was going to leave because of the fact that this divorce proceeding was driving a wedge into her relationship with Mr. Dulos. The defendant was obviously, a jury can infer, extremely upset and motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos, as evidenced by the fact that she stated when referring to Jennifer Dulos, that that bitch should be buried next to the dog. 
thus demonstrating severe animus towards Jennifer Dulos and explicitly referencing her death a month or so leading up to Jennifer Dulos' disappearance. And even after Jennifer's disappearance, the defendant's animus towards Jennifer Dulos continued, as evidenced by the fact that she told Pavel Gamini that she was going to, quote, kill Jennifer when she turned up. Now, the defense will say, well, that proves she didn't know. The jury doesn't have to accept that. The jury can accept that as merely a self-serving statement in an effort to cover up her involvement in the crime, but while still expressing severe animus towards Jennifer Dulos. The jury can also infer, Your Honor, reasonably that the defendant had advanced knowledge of the murder and actively tried to help Mr. Dulos with his false alibi. After all, the defendant was home at the time or the approximate time of the murder and purposely, the jury can infer, answered his phone to help establish his alibi, as evidenced by the fact that Mr. Dulos wrote in his alibi script that he initially answered the phone. The phone call, of course, was from Mr. Dulos's friend who subsequently refused to cooperate in the investigation, and that call, according to the data, had been arranged the day before. The defendant, of course, did not mention this call in her first two interviews, and in fact, indicated in the second interview that she had not seen Mr. Dulos's phone at all. The defendant actively lied about Mr. Dulos's whereabouts on the morning of the crime, even after being told that Mr. Dulos was responsible for Jennifer Dulos's death. And the evidence is, if Mr. Dulos was in New Canaan killing Jennifer Dulos, which the defense has essentially conceded, although they don't concede the intent, that the defendant was home alone with Mr. Dulos's phone and manipulating it. That's the evidence. She's unlocking the phone, she's playing with the phone at times when Mr. Dulos is in New Canaan. And that, again, is something the jury can draw a reasonable inference that this whole thing with the phone call was a planned event. The defendant was in possession of his phone, waiting for the call that had been prearranged the night before. The jury can also infer, Your Honor, consciousness of guilt based on the fact that the defendant actively assisted Mr. Dulos in attempting to conceal evidence of the crime, thus demonstrating a consciousness of guilt with respect to the conspiracy to commit murder. And that, of course, serves as the basis for counts two through six. The defendant, incidentally, says that the, the court at this point needs to make a finding that it was one conspiracy. They cited no case for that proposition, Your Honor. It's just simply false. Um, the, a reasonable jury could reject some or all of these counts, and it's up to the jury to decide whether or not um, the state has proven each element of each crime beyond reasonable doubt. They cite no case for that proposition whatsoever. But nonetheless, those counts, the uh, defendant, I guess, was claiming that because the state didn't indicate uh, evidence of others being involved in the crime, number one, that's not true because we have the testimony regarding Mr. Dulos's friend making the phone call, not cooperating, but also not required for conspiracy to commit murder. The only thing we have to prove, Your Honor, is that she agreed with one or more persons. That's the state of the law. So it's false to say that we somehow had to prove that she conspired with other people besides Mr. Dulos. <clears throat> with respect to the uh, tampering counts, Judge, we have charged her uh, under an accessorial liability with respect to that. Um, the test is essentially that the defendant believed an official proceeding or criminal investigation was pending or about to be instituted, helped Mr. Dulos discard the evidence at issue, and acted with the intent to prevent the use of evidence at an official proceeding or criminal investigation. I'll direct the court to State versus Forsaw, which is 214 Con 540. Then in that case, evidence that the defendant had discarded a murder weapon before any contact with police officers or of the judicial system was sufficient to convict the defendant of tampering with evidence. So there's no requirement, Your Honor, that actually an official proceeding ever begin or the timing of it, merely that the defendant believed one was about to be initiated. So what can the jury find with respect to counts two and three? A reasonable jury could find the following, that the defendant agreed to assist Mr. Dulos in the destruction of physical evidence and assisted him based on the following. She was present at 80 Mountain Spring Road shortly after the Tacoma arrived and drove back and forth several times. Your Honor, I apologize. Uh, the state may the have a moment. We we're having a technical issue. Certainly.
May I proceed? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. A reasonable jury can find that she was present at 80 Mountain Spring Road shortly after the Tacoma arrived back and after the, this crime was committed, and that she drove back and forth several times. A reasonable jury can find that she believed a police investigation was about to begin and that she was actively helping Mr. Dulos, as evidenced by the fact that she brought cleaning supplies. A reasonable jury can find that she accompanied Mr. Dulos to Hartford and was present as he disposed of those items and that she actually assisted him in the disposal of the license plates by opening her door at the exact moment that he opened his door and left it open until he dumped those license plates in the sewer. If you look at the video very carefully, Judge, what you're gonna see is a vehicle there that she's attempting to block and a reasonable jury can make that finding. She's trying to block the view of that particular vehicle. A reasonable jury can find she was aware of what was in the construction bags as evidenced by her many lies about the entire day, including the fact that she was present at 80 Mountain Spring Road and was going back and forth repeatedly and apparently lighting fires, which is again consistent with the destruction of evidence. She actively assisted in the cleanup process prior to going to Hartford, including bringing cleaning supplies, which incidentally were consistent with those which were found in Hartford including a green and yellow sponge, a broom or a mop handle, and black garbage bags, all found in Hartford that the defendant admitted to bringing to 80 Mountain Spring Road. The defendant's DNA is located on the opening of a bag that tested positive for blood, had Jennifer Dulos's DNA, and had duct tape, and was found amongst other bags matched to Jennifer Dulos's untimely death, specifically a bag that contained a bloody shirt and bra confirmed to be human blood that was forensically linked to the DNA of Jennifer Dulos. With respect to counts five and six, Judge, a reasonable jury could find that the Tacoma was used in the commission of this crime and the defendant assisted Mr. Dulos in his effort to conceal evidence found within and upon the Tacoma. As the court knows, the Tacoma was viewed on video surveillance leaving 80 Mountain Spring Road in the early morning hours. It was tracked on surveillance footage heading down to the New Canaan area. It was parked near Waveney Park in the general area where Jennifer's Suburban was found. Approximately 40 minutes or so after Jennifer's Suburban was viewed leaving her residence, the Tacoma was seen traveling north on the Merritt Parkway where it essentially tracked right back to 80 Mountain Spring Road. A reasonable jury can conclude that evidence relating to the crime of Jennifer Dulos was inside of that vehicle based on, number one, her blood being present, and yes, they can make that finding on one of the seats. The defendant's acknowledgement that Dulos was cleaning the vehicle, and Dulos's paranoia and insistence that Mr. Gamini get rid of the seats from the Tacoma. Moreover, a reasonable jury can conclude that the defendant was at 80 Mountain Spring Road during the cleanup of the Tacoma and in fact admitted to assisting Mr. Dulos throw away a paper towel that apparently was being used to clean the Tacoma. The fact that she says it's coffee is not dispositive. The jury can merely view this as a self-serving statement, especially in light of all the other evidence in her lies. The defendant took the keys to the Tacoma, and a reasonable jury can conclude that she took the keys to the Tacoma because she understood that Mr. Dulos had used it in the commission of the crime and they wanted to keep the Tacoma in Farmington so that they could continue their efforts to clean up. The defendant drove in tandem with Mr. Dulos to the car wash, knowing that he was gonna wash the car in an effort to conceal evidence of the crime. Again, a reasonable jury can make that finding, especially given that she initially tried to sort of fudge those facts to the police and lie about it and say that he'd called her to come pick him up. And then when she's pressed, she says, oh, well, maybe we went together. The Tacoma was extremely clean when it was found by investigators. So clean, in fact, that despite the fact that it was an 18-year-old work vehicle, there were numerous places where there was no DNA profiles at all, thus showing evidence of the destruction of evidence in the cleanup. DNA expert Kristen Maydell testified that DNA can be destroyed by wiping it or using water or shampoo. Thus, a reasonable jury can conclude that there was evidence destroyed in connection with this case. The defendant also showed consciousness of guilt with respect to this by not telling investigators that the Tacoma was at 80 Mountain Spring Road, thus demonstrating her understanding that this was used in the commission of the crime during her first two interviews. The defendant also failed to tell the police 
that this vehicle had been washed during the first two interviews, again demonstrating consciousness of guilt. With respect to the hindering count, Your Honor, obviously um, the defendant, by following Mr. Dulos out, meeting him at the car wash, and a reasonable jury can infer that she understood that the crime of murder had been committed. Incidentally, this is five days later, um, but certainly, Judge, uh, a reasonable jury can infer based on all the evidence that she understood that that vehicle was evidence of a crime. And she picks him up and provides transportation, essentially through the use of her vehicle, back to the car wash so that these things can be done. And she also, um, coincidentally, her phone number is the number that is used on the call log, which again, a reasonable jury can view as an effort to distance Mr. Dulos from the car wash. Perhaps they thought that she wasn't under investigation, even if he was. And again, a reasonable jury can make all of these findings. So, Your Honor, um, again, this isn't a motion about we have a different interpretation of the evidence. That's what closing argument is for. The question for this court is, has the state presented sufficient evidence for mm -hmm. to proceed? And of course we have, Your Honor, based on our argument. Does the court have any questions? Yes. Uh, the court is reviewing the information that the court read to the jury that information was filed on or about October 5th, 2023. The court is reviewing count five. I apologize, Your Honor. I don't have a copy in front of me if I can just. Sure, thank you. And the information reads, the court is just going to read the pertinent part. On the 29th day of May 2019 in the town of Avon in the area of 265 West Main Street, that being Russell Speeders, the defendant, Michelle Taconis, believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted, and an official proceeding was pending and about to be instituted, did alter, destroy, conceal, and remove a thing with the purpose of impairing its availability. What evidence did the state introduce on that count? Yes, sir. The uh, evidence is the car wash itself. And, and if I may just be heard on this, because I did hear Attorney Schoenhorn's argument, but um, we charged her as an accessory in this particular count, Your Honor. And I know there, I didn't think that this was going to be an issue, but I'm happy to provide the court with the case law. But essentially, by putting the accessory statute, we put the defendant on notice that that is a theory that we are pursuing. And so the court needs to view that count in light of that allegation that she was an accessory. And so the fact that the Tacoma itself was brought to the car wash, if a reasonable jury can infer that the Tacoma itself was used in a crime, then the jury can infer that she aided Mr. Dulos in the tampering of that evidence by providing him with transportation, by allowing her phone number to be used, and that the destruction of evidence happened. So there is no requirement, Your Honor, based on the way that we've charged this, that we prove that she actually um, altered the evidence herself because we've charged her under an accessorial liability theory. Thank you. Um, very briefly, I just want to respond to a couple of things. Um, I'm actually a little surprised to hear Mr. Uh, McGinnis say that um, the luminol was tested and confirmed to be blood on all these items. That's simply untrue. There were three items total that were tested. None of the others were tested. This all goes back to um, the suggestion they can infer if it's blood from that is not only improper, but I submit that if they argue that point to the jury, that's considered pro prosecutorial misconduct based on that. So I submit that that's just a erroneous uh, statement. With regard to um, this, the, the bold assertion that Mr. Dulos was in New Canaan that day, and so therefore he wasn't home, I submit there's no proof of that. We concede he had something to do 
with a plan, but they cannot prove that it was Mr. Dulos who was there on May 24th, in light of the fact he was there on May 22nd. And therefore, they cannot, uh, as I cited, I don't even hear the state uh, referring to that recent uh, Connecticut Supreme Court case on, um, on DNA that I just cited a few minutes ago. So, uh, uh, and about transfer DNA. But be that as it may, there is not uh, evidence that all of these other items were tested and found to be positive for Jennifer Dulos's blood. If there's evidence of homicidal, uh, uh, of, ha, ha, let me rephrase that, evidence of a homicide, that does not prove intent. That doesn't improve murder, <clears throat> it improves an untimely death. And um, a motive, even if a motive exists, is not equal to a conspiracy. There may be a lot of people that you might wish ill will to, but in the absence of either knowledge or actual overt action, it doesn't translate that into finding, well, if you don't like somebody, that's the motive to, uh, to kill them. Uh, the argument that she, quote, actively concealed, unquote, evidence of the crime is also completely speculative and made up. The fact that there was a fire in a fireplace during the afternoon, the suggestion they can say, well, she must be burning evidence of a crime. She must know that there is a crime being committed, that therefore the fact that there's a fire in her fireplace is proof of that, I submit would be pure speculation. In fact, half of what I just heard is speculation upon speculation upon speculation. Um, I would note that Mr. Uh, Gumieni, for example, did not identify the red truck uh, that was on the side of Latham Road as being his. The only time he identified a vehicle as looking like his was somewhere on the Merritt Parkway. There's the one angle from the rest stop on the, and I can't remember as I'm standing here whether that was Fairfield um, or New Cane, but I believe it was Fairfield where he said yes because it has that um, bar in the front. He recognized that. None of the others are identified by Mr. Gumieni as being uh, his vehicle. So I submit there is no evidence that that's the truck on the road. What's more important and kind of interesting, Your Honor, there's no evidence of when the Chevy Suburban ended up on Latham Road until 8.30 p.m. when it was discovered by the police. There is zero evidence it was there during the day. There's no vehicle. There's no one who passed by that saw it. There's no cameras from any buses that show it there at any other time. And we do have evidence that, her, that a phone that's been paired to that, um, that vehicle um, since 2018, and which the evidence shows she was going to see Dr. Geronimus. So that is her phone. The state objected to my asking Ms. Farber about that, but it's obviously clear in light of the testimony that that phone was Jennifer Dulos's phone paired to that vehicle at 2.56 p.m. on the afternoon of May 24th, 2019. And the state concedes that Mr. Dulos was in Farmington at at least one o'clock or so on that uh, afternoon of the 24th. The idea that, um, I'm not sure I misunderstood Mr. McGinnis, so I apologize in advance that he said that um, that, she, that they don't have to show whether who these unnamed speculative co-conspirators were. I, I don't know if he said that she, they, had to sh they didn't have to show which one of them she conspired with, or he said the opposite, that they don't have to name other people as long as they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she conspired with photos duos. Um, I also submit, Your Honor, because you know, I prepared for that, that the state misread and misstates the holding in State versus Forshaw, which I also cited. In Forshaw, the defendant actually shot someone in the presence of numerous witnesses, then fled, then got rid of the weapon. In that case, the court held, the Connecticut Supreme Court held, that it was obvious that there would be a criminal proceeding that was going to be commenced because she knew there were witnesses, and the fact that she fled from it was um, you know, it was obvious to anybody that there would be a criminal proceeding 
pending. We're talking about here what's basically um, hindsight bias, hindsight creation of what someone should have figured out after the fact based on what was happening at the time. At the time, there is no evidence whatsoever that Michelle Traconis knew what Fotis Doulos or anyone he conspired with or uh, aided uh, did to Jennifer Doulos on that day. <clears throat> and there's also no evidence. She did not provide, this is also clear, she did not provide transportation to Mr. Doulos to go to the um, car wash. She was going to an appointment with her lawyer and she picked him up at the car wash and brought him down to Westport with her, and he drove. That's the only evidence that's in this case on that point. Finally, there was no evidence of blood, I want to be clear, in that, in that Tacoma. None. None. There's no evidence she cleaned the Tacoma. She didn't even see Dulos cleaning the Tacoma. All she knows is he handed her a paper towel, said that he had spilled coffee, handed it to her, and put it. And she put it in a garbage bag. Whatever he was doing inside that Tacoma, there is zero evidence that she saw him. In fact, Pavel knew what he was doing. Pavel uh, was told by Dulos that there might have been a hair of, of uh, his wife in there, so he wanted him to take out those seats. So if anyone had knowledge that there may be evidence of a crime in there, it's Pavel Gumien and not Michelle Turconis. The only difference, I guess, is that Mr. Uh, Urzo, Attorney Urzo, representing Mr. Gumieni, had the wherewithal and obtained um, immunity in exchange for cooperation. That's something that Ms. Traconis did not ask for and did not receive. And that's the only reason I submit she's sitting here today. The only reason she's sitting here today. The state talks about, well, we charged her. The court had a question about the tampering at, at Avon, at the car wash. They said, well, we charged her as an accessory to alert the defense. But again, you have to act with the exact same state of mind. And so the leap of logic that the state is asking this court to jump to, or for that matter, the jury to come to, she must have thought there was some evidence that would lead to a criminal prosecution or a criminal proceeding because she picked him up. She left at the same time, but that she picked him up at the car wash. And we don't even know what time that was. We just know the approximate time that the coal went in to pick her up, to, for her to come get him. But she wasn't even within range that he could just jump into a car and leave. He had to call her on the phone. And the one last thing that I think there is absolutely no evidence, and it's also, again, improper, Mr. McGinnis just said that the defendant allowed her phone to be used at the car wash. That is simply definitively a false statement. There is no evidence she allowed her phone to be used by Mr. Dulos when a number was written down by the car wash employee. And if your court will recall, just a, two, just a couple of days earlier, Mr. Dulos's phone, his regular phone, had been seized by the police. And it is just as likely, not just as likely, is extremely likely that at that moment he didn't know the phone number, his, the one that he was now using, so he used one that was in Ms. Traconis's possession when they went down, when they were about to go down to Attorney Bowman's office. So based on that, Your Honor, I, I tried to respond to the arguments. I, I'm not going to fight or even contest the fact that there was some kind of untimely death that the jury could find was based on this evidence. I'm just submitting that there is not the evidence that was just submitted by Mr. McGinnis and the idea that one could put assumption upon assumption on speculation upon speculation and reach that conclusion based on this evidence is not even warm gruel. It is absolutely, there is no logical inferences that could be drawn that could lead to the conclusion that Michelle Torconis 
knew anything, anything about what has either happened to uh, uh, Ms. Farber or what Fotis Doulos was doing in, in a criminal act conduct in relation to her disappearance. Thank you. Just quickly, Judge, um, a counsel completely misstates the state's position on these things. What I've said is that a reasonable jury can draw these inferences, um, not that uh, these things are definitively in the record at this point. Obviously, a reasonable jury can infer that the defendant allowed her cell phone to be used as evidence in the totality of all the evidence, so he misstates it. I also never said that all these items were tested positive for blood, I, and I don't think I even used the word luminol in my argument, so I guess we're just making things up now uh, as we argue to the court, but I did just want to follow up on the one issue, Judge, State versus Vasquez, 68 Con App 194 on the accessory liability issue. I just wanted to give the court one case. I didn't have a chance to research all of them. Just on that count five issue. Thank you. The court will just begin by indicating what the court has to find in a motion for judgment of acquittal. Of course, the court does not have to determine that the state has proven each and every element of each and every offense beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the province of the jury. The court has to determine whether there is sufficient evidence on each count to go to the jury. Now, in so doing, the court cannot, in this court's view, allow to filter into its decision what the court thinks of any witness's credibility. The court is not making credibility determinations in determining how it will rule on a motion for judgment of acquittal. What the court is required to do and is able to do is to determine what, if any, reasonable and logical inferences can be drawn from the evidence that has been adduced So the court is going to address the motion in just broad strokes. This is in no way a marshalling of evidence. Concerning intent of the defendant, the jury can reasonably consider that the defendant's remark that Jennifer Dulo should be buried next to the dog is evidence of motivation. The jury need not conclude that. The jury can consider it. That statement was made before May 24. The jury can consider certainly that the blood found on the cut garments in the trash on Albany Avenue is evidence of Fotis Dulos' intent to restrain and kill Jennifer Farber Dulos. The jury can reasonably conclude that because the defendant indicated that Dulos was at home on the early morning hours of May 24, but indicated later on that he was not, that she knew where he was going to go on May 24 and was covering for him. The discarding of evidence on Albany Avenue uh, is an indication that the defendant knew the purpose for which those items are being discarded. The jury can conclude that even though the defendant did not drive Fotis Dulos to Russell Speeders, that there probably was an arrangement whereby he told her, pick me up later, 
at Russell Speeders, which means she knew the reason he was going to be there. The jury can conclude these things. Again, the court is not required to assess the strength of the evidence. The court is just required to determine whether or not there is enough evidence to go to the jury. Now concerning the remarks about multiple conspiracies, the court believes the Second Circuit has concluded that a conspiracy terminates when the central purposes of that conspiracy are attained. So uh, for example, uh, if the central purposes of the murder of Jennifer Dulos had been attained on May 24th, that's the end of that conspiracy. Then there's another conspiracy. So, and that conspiracy is to hinder prosecution or tamper with evidence, for example. So the court is not persuaded that the state cannot charge multiple conspiracies and it is uh, too early to consider at this point any arguments concerning a vacator of any of the convictions, if there are any convictions. So the court finds that there is enough evidence to go to the jury on counts one through six. And the motion for judgment of acquittal is denied. Time is 11.25. We'll resume the session at 11.40. We'll stand in a recess. All rise. This honorable square court now stands in recess.
Uh, what the court will take up first is uh, the schedule for the rest of the trial. The court understands that uh, the defense has at least one witness scheduled for today and probably will not conclude until Monday. Is that correct, Attorney Sean? Um, we are endeavoring to complete by Friday, but based on just everyone's schedule and whatnot, it, it, we are we may not conclude till Monday morning, but it's very likely we might be able to conclude by Friday. I'm just indicating there are witnesses for each day. If they're not as long as anticipated, then we might be done by Friday. We're trying to have everyone here by Friday, but we would have to cancel if it was running late. Thank you. And Your Honor, if I may just be heard briefly. Uh, counsel has informed us the last night of a few names of who may be called today. And prior to them coming out, uh, the state wanted to raise an uh, issue with respect to, I think, two of the witnesses uh, outside the jury's presence. So I, I would ask Your Honor if you wish to do that now or to hold off. Uh, well, right now, let's just continue with the scheduling. Yes, Your Honor. The court is going to assume that the defense will conclude sometime on Monday morning. So what the court will ask uh, both uh, sides to do is uh, file with the court proposed jury instructions by the close of business on Friday. The court will anticipate that the defense will present its, its last witness on Monday after the defense's last witness, uh, we will go into the charge conference, which has to be on the record. The court then anticipates after the charge conference, the court will proceed with the contempt hearing. Tuesday morning, closing arguments. Attorney Manning. Yes, Your Honor. The state yesterday that uh, they intend to introduce, uh, I'll start with the Farmington police officers, Your Honor, with respect to the evidence concerning the, um, moment, the manner of death of Fotos Dulos and essentially the suicide, Your Honor, as well as a suicide note that was found next to him. Uh, the state's position, Your Honor, is that this evidence is completely irrelevant to the case. It has nothing to do with uh, Michelle Traconis or the charges that she is faced with. And the state is uh, seeking to be heard on if that evidence is going to be presented in what way. And some feels that there should be an offer of proof and am, am requesting an offer of proof with respect to the Farmington police officers that were subpoenaed today. Um, there also, counsel also provided the state with the name of a Cheryl Briere. That name appears nowhere in any police report or in connection with this case in any way, shape, or form. So the state is asking for some kind of offer of proof as to what the relevance is of Ms. Briere. I would indicate if it is character evidence, it would not be for truthfulness because the defendant has not testified as of yet. So the only thing the state could assume, and I, again, I don't like assuming when it comes to this, is that she would be a character with witness for some kind of character trait at issue. I just feel uh, at this point, Your Honor, since Ms. Briere's name is not in any way on any form, report, or in any way connected to the case, uh, the state is uh, requesting either an offer of proof or that she be precluded from testifying. Uh, do you wish to respond, Attorney Schoenar? Yeah, I don't have my witness list uh, in front of me. The I don't want to call it a witness list, list of names. I just want to confer with that first, if I may. <clears throat> Her name is on the list, Your Honor, so I think that the state's claim is unfounded. 
I just want to be clear. I'm not claiming she's not on the list. She was. She's not relevant to anything in this matter. She does not appear on any police report, any statement given, anything that has to do with this case. So the state has no notice as to the content of her testimony. As such, the state is asking for an offer of proof outside the presence of the jury in order to find out exactly what she will be testifying to. I will just recall what the court said when we objected to witnesses who were irrelevant. The court said they'll take it up as the witness is on the stand if there's a particular question. Um, we filed, I can't even remember how many, 20 motions in limine. The court did not require the state once to do an offer of proof, not once during their case. So the fact that she's now asking for that, for a witness just because she did not or the state did not go out and investigate people that they've had since October. And I know we weren't required to provide a list, but these, this name was definitely on the list. There were a number of names we put on that list. The state cannot now claim, well, we didn't know when they failed to investigate uh, the names on the list. As the court is well aware, the defense could have simply called people. We don't have to give the court a preview of what each person is going to testify to. They can object if something is asked that is not relevant. I know the rules of evidence. We certainly wouldn't be caught, even if, and I note this is not what we're doing, but even if we were going to put on um, evidence of, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, character, even if that was, we would not be required to have that person write out a letter of recommendation to what they were going to testify to. So this is not only unnecessary, but it's also unheard of as far as I'm concerned, Your Honor. Well, the court will first address the representation by the state that uh, a witness is to be called <coughs> by the defense to testify about the manner of death of Fotis Dulos. How is that relevant? Well, first of all, this is not this morning's testimony, Your Honor. So again, I didn't get any opportunity to have the defense. The state has had not once had to make an offer of proof towards any of their witnesses. The purpose of presenting the evidence of the fact that he is unavailable as a witness, the state was allowed to uh, state on the record that Mr. Mawinney was unavailable. I'm entitled in our case to show the circumstances under which he is not available in the case. I do not intend these police officers to testify as to cause of death. It's the fact of death. There's going to be a death certificate that I intended to introduce to show he's not available. So it's relevant to the circumstances, certainly more relevant than I would submit half of the state's case was about the lack of evidence that they were able to present. Well, so, it, it is not a stipulation that Cordes Dulos is deceased. No, Your Honor, and we're not willing to stipulate to that. Well, well, the court's question is, for what reason are you calling the Farmington police? I'm the state represented that it's to indicate that Fotis Dulos is deceased. So, and then the court understood you to just say that you're not willing to stipulate to that. I'm just going to note that at no time did this court require the state That's to give... That's not the question. The question is... You just indicated to the court that you wanted to call the police officer to testify that Fotis Dulos is deceased. I No, Your Honor, I didn't say that. I said that's Perhaps the, the court misunderstood. Yes, it's the individual officer who found uh, Mr. Dulos in his vehicle on, on the date in question. That is the purpose, on, and that, for the record, would be January... January 28, 2020. Um, I've heard the state say, well, the jury may have questions about it. There's been some testimony about the circumstances. This is to complete that circle, if you will. And then I would be introducing a death certificate and a decree of death as certified copy of the decree of, of uh, probate death. Well, just to close that circle of information. And that is the purpose of that testimony. The court does not understand what the circle is. The court is under no impression that the jury 
would have questions about whether or not Fotis Dulos is deceased. So, well, again, I've made my offer. I didn't think I should have to, but I did. If the court is indicating that we cannot present that portion of our defense, at least it'll be on the record. But I'm indicating that we would intend to put on evidence of where he was found, that he was taken to the hospital. And, and then there's also the fact, which I would then, once we've presented that, there is the suicide note where he exonerates Ms. Traconis. I recognize that it doesn't come in under as a statement in contemplation of death. In other words, it's not a dying declaration, but I would attempt to present sufficient evidence that it would come in under the residual hearsay exception that there is no other way to get that statement in. The court may, at that point, in its discretion, determine it doesn't meet that, but I have to put on the evidence in order to reach that point. Again, for the first time in this case, only the defense is being Counsel, required. Counsel, you need not repeat that. The court right. was not aware of what the defense counsel was attempting to do. If it was simply the fact that Fotis Dulos is deceased, the court would not allow that testimony because it's not relevant. The fact that Fotis Dulos essentially wanted to exculpate the defendant is another matter. If I may be heard on that, Your Honor. Well, that's going to be a matter that comes up at the time. That's fine. Thank you. Again, if the matter was simply Fotis Dulos is deceased, the court would not allow it. Which witness uh, is the defense prepared to uh, call at this time? Robert Haynes, Your Honor. <clears throat> We can bring the jury in, please. Sir, so would you raise your right hand, please? I'll judge the jury. The jury isn't in jury. yet. Counsel, stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your yeah. Honor. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall get concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon counsel of party? I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Robert Haynes, R-O-B-E-R-T-H-A-I-N-E-S. <coughs> Thank you, sir, and you may be seated. Thank you. Quiet. Good morning, Mr. Haynes. Hi. Um, you go by another name. I know your formal <clears throat> name is Robert Haynes, but can you tell the jury what you're often referred to as? Yeah, Hutch. Hutch would be great. All right. Um, and you're here pursuant to a subpoena, correct? Correct. You and I haven't spoken until about a day ago? Nope. And you're familiar with Michelle Traconis? Yes. You haven't spoken to Michelle Tricona since 2019? No. Do you own a property with a leak or pond on it? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about that property and where it is? <clears throat> we have um, a water ski pond in Avon, Avon, Connecticut. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a private membership. We're all very serious water skiers. Um, you, you would join the club, and it's, it's really kind of a community. It's a very small community. We all pretty much are there <clears throat> most days, and we are tournament skiers, so we practice during the week, and a lot of times we'll, some of us will be competing on the weekends and traveling, and um, there's about 30 members, and it's, it's a big family. I'm going to ask you a few questions just about the pond and the area. Uh, 
you call it a pond, in terms of compared to other water ski areas, is it a relatively small pond or a large one? <clears throat> it is small. No, it's very small. Um, a lot of people will ski on open lakes. This pond is about 1,600 feet long and maybe 300 feet wide. So mm -hmm. it's not a pond where you can go off and just really ski and go for long runs. It's a competitive site where you're, you're either in a slalom course or you're on a jump or some people will trick ski. So it's a, it's, it's a three event competitive lake versus like an open water lake. Are, are Very small. Uh, are you familiar with the term short setup? Short setup, yeah. So the short setup is um, in most in most places or most lakes, you can get up behind the boat. This is referring to slalom skiing. You get up behind the boat. You have a minute or two to adjust your shorts or whatever, and then you're in the course. You go through gates around six ways, and then you drop at the end of the lake. Our lake is incredibly short in that you get up and you don't have time to do anything you are immediately in the gates you go through the six buoys and then you're in the water again so you come <clears throat> you literally come up behind the boat behind the boat you ski for 16 seconds and then you drop down and then you do it again so you're not you're not even skiing for a minute and this property that it, you own this property? Yes. Is it private property? It is. Um, how long have you had the ski club? Um, we've been skiing there for about 45 years, I would say. Um, I'm 58. I started skiing there when I was about 10. The club itself is probably, I don't know, 25, maybe a little bit more, 25 years old. And is the pond open year round? No. Can you tell the jury a little bit about how the season works when it starts and when it ends? It's very weather dependent, but the earliest we could possibly open would be the end of March if, um, if weather cooperated. We have some really serious skiers in our club that will put on heavy wetsuits and ski in very, very cold water. So they might get started at the end of March. Typically, typically we wouldn't really start skiing until May. And uh, we would ski always through September and a lot of times to the end of October. And during that period of time when you're open during ski season, is it throughout the week? Is it Monday through Sunday or just on the weekends? It's every day. So it's every single day. There's people there all the time. Um, you know, with 30 members, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people in our club that might find odd times to ski when they know there's not a crowd there. Because if you go on a, on a Wednesday at 5 o'clock when people get out of work, there might be, you know, 10 people waiting to ski. And that could be an hour and a half or two hour wait. Is it more crowded on the weekends? It's more crowded on the weekends, but on the weekends, everybody has all day. So they can hang out and not, you know, you're losing daylight on a Wednesday. So we may be only, only be able to ski till 8 o'clock at night. So from 5 to 8, everybody's trying to get their ski set in. On a weekend, there may actually be more people there, but you have all day to ski. So it's, there's no, nobody's worried about getting their time in. Would people make reservations to be able to ski or would they just come down and show up? Pretty much they would just come down and show up. So, yeah. And while people were waiting to be pulled on the skis or to ride the boat, um, would they often hang out? Is there an area for people to hang out? So we have a very large dock um, and most of, and we do have like a picnic area with a tent over it and um, we have a couple areas to hang out, but yeah, everybody, I mean, you're, everybody would socialize in one place or another, and you're waiting. You could be waiting two hours to ski. So you're there, you know, you're there just kind of hanging out. You'd get in and out of the boat. You'd take turns driving the boat. Um, you'd take turns 
riding because you always need a driver and you need somebody riding. Um, so you're working ski lines and you know all that kind of thing. So everybody, it's busy. Everybody has kind of something to do, but it, at the same time, I mean, <clears throat> these guys, the people that are in the club, most of the people have been members there from the beginning. So it's it's a family. You're hanging out, talking to them, and you know. A lot of times talking smack. <laughs> and would, would people bring dinner or lunch down sure. there sometimes? Yep. So, and, yep. And when you say people um, had been there mostly from the beginning, was are, are you familiar with Fotis Dulos? Yes. Was he a member of the ski club? Yes. Do you remember when he joined the ski club? I, I can't tell you exactly what year, but I'm going to say it was 2005, maybe. He, um, I know he moved to Connecticut with his first wife and joined our club. And I got to say it's, I don't know, I got to say it's 20 years ago. Do you know the name of his first wife? Hillary. Um, had you met Fotis Doulas prior to 2005? Yes, I've known him. He was a water skier, so I've known him, you know, through water skiing, um, probably 10 years prior to that. So since 19, about 1995? Probably, yeah. So when, um, the first time I spent any time with Botus was when I got married. Boy, don't ask me for a date because my wife's out there. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. But um, we flew to Greece on our honeymoon and <clears throat> I had Fotis' name, and we um, met Fotis one day, and he showed us around. Our honeymoon was in Greece, and he showed us around Greece. That was really the first time I ever spent any time with him. And was Fotis a competitive water skier? Yes. Were you also a competitive water skier? Yes. Uh, did you see him at water ski tournaments? Uh, yeah, definitely. In state as well as out of state? Yes. Do you know whether Fotis often traveled um, out of state for competitive water ski tournaments? He did. He was, for in his younger years, he was on the Greek team. So he, he water skied for Greece. So those are European tournaments. Um, and then he would ski tournaments all around the country in the US. Did you also come to know Fotis's children? Yeah. Do you know whether they water ski? They did. Do you know whether they traveled out of the state for competitive water ski tournaments? They did, all the time. And was that with Fotis? Yes. Had you, in fact, seen them out of the state at competitive water ski tournaments? Yes. Had you had the opportunity to observe Fotis at the water ski club with his children? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about um, whether or not they water skied together and for the amount of time that they may have stayed at the club, not as to what was said, but just your observations. And to, to narrow it down to a certain time period, I'll say between 2015 to 2019. So I'm going to object, Your Honor. Uh, this is a, irrelevant. It's a vague question. It's well, uh, relevant, counsel. Um, just his observations and awareness of uh, Fotis during that time and what he observed. Not relevant to Spain. Did you know Jennifer Dulos? Yes. Did uh, Jennifer water ski? No. Did she hang out at the pond ever? Objection. The time frame, vague. Well, Any? well the, the, the question is ever. So overruled. You can answer. Uh, Rarely. She would, she would come down, <clears throat> so her kids would be, most of the time, her kids would come to the pond <clears throat> with, um, with a nanny, and um, they would ski with Fotis, and their nanny would be on shore taking care of them. Um, it's not that Jennifer was never there. She was there every once in a while, but she wasn't she wasn't there most of the time when the kids were there. It was always a nanny. Prior to 2017, did you ever socialize with uh, Fotis and Jennifer? Objection. Uh, 
Relevance, 2017, prior to 2017. Relevance, counsel. Your Honor, uh, I'm getting into Mr. Haynes's knowledge of the time period when Ms. Traconis moved into the house and Ms. Dulos moved out of the house. That's going to be my next question. Well, the objection is sustained. Did there come a time in 2017 when, um, do you know where Photos Dulos lived in 2017? Jefferson Crossing, right? Yes. Um, is that, is that where yes. Mr. Dulos lived yeah. at the time? Did there come a time when Ms. Dulos no longer lived at Jefferson Crossing? Objection. Well, um, what's the ground, please? Relevance, it calls for speculation. Well, if, if there was a friendship, it would not call for speculation, so overruled. You can answer the question. I don't recall him ever, well, he was a builder, so he lived in a lot of homes. But I don't, in that time frame, I don't remember him moving out of that house. Do you recall whether Jennifer moved out of the yes. house in 2017? Uh, did there come a time when you met uh, Michelle Traconis? Um, I met Michelle very briefly at a water ski tournament in Florida. Um, Fotis had his kids down there. I had my kids down there. And um, I was briefly introduced to her. Uh, I, I thought it had to have been 2016, maybe. So prior to 2017, yeah. you recall meeting maybe, Mr. Conus? Maybe 2017, yeah. Do you know if Michelle Traconis moved up to Connecticut? Um, she, yes, she did. And do you know when that was? There was definitely um, a long gap after the 2000, after I first met her, I feel like it was probably a year or maybe two years after that. I don't, don't hold me to the time frame, but um, I know she moved up a little bit, at, I mean, a ways after my first encounter with her. Did, um, around that time period, did Fotis ever talk about um, an intention that he moved Michelle up here? Yes, he talked about it about having a girlfriend and eventually he was gonna get her up here, yes. Did Michelle ever join the ski club? Yes. Do you know when she joined the ski club? Um, I think it was 2017. I think it was 2000, it was either 2017 or 2018, but she was a member. Would you see Michelle at the pond frequently in 2017? Yes. Would you speak with Michelle when she was at the pond? Yes. And you said that at the pond there were sometimes social events? Um, yeah, I mean, not planned, but there was so many of us around all the time that, you know, regularly, I mean, there were summers where we eat dinner down there every night, and there's always other people around. So whether it's simple as getting a pizza or doing something a little bit more where everybody's bringing something. Yeah, we had, you know, social gatherings all the time. It wasn't a planned gathering. Everybody would ski and then just hang out. So between 2017 until early 2019, had Michelle and Fotis attended some of these social gatherings? Sure. And had you socialized with Michelle and Fotis outside of the pond on occasion? Yes. You had told the jury that Fotis uh, had skied, water skied with the children at the pond. Did there ever come a time um, when Fotis was unable to ski with the children at the pond? Objection. Grounds. Calls for relevance, calls for speculation, hearsay. Well, the court is not clear on the relevance. Your Honor, I'm going to link it. It's subject to connection. If I can ask a few follow-up questions, I'm going to establish Mr. Doulos's um, behavior related to the custody and visitation. Well, there's no foundation for questions about custody and visitation with this witness. 
I need to ask some foundational questions, Your Honor, related well, you to You can that. ask the, the direct question. Did there come a time when you learned that uh, Fotis could not see his children? Objection. Calls for hearsay. Well, overruled. I, I remember a point where, I, and I felt like it was sudden because I wasn't completely knowledgeable on everything that was going on, but I, I remember that Jennifer at one time left the home, and I believe she took her children with her. Do you remember, without getting into what was said, Fotis's, um demeanor or emotion or attitude towards not being able to see his children? Objection. Overruled. Oh, he was, uh, he was upset. He was very upset. I mean, those children were his life. I'm going to fast forward now to 2019, um, prior to the ski season getting into full swing. Um, did Fotis ever express to you an immediate expectation that he would be skiing with the kids at the pond again? Yes. And that he was expecting to be able to take the kids to compete in water skiing again? I don't object, Your Honor. This all calls for hearsay expectation of future, immediate future conduct. Which he would say and express, which is a hearsay statement. Well, at this point, the question is, or is the question, did Fotis Dulos talk to this witness about his expectations? Is that the question? Yes, Your Honor. And if I may, Your Honor, when, what time, and again, it's a hearsay statement about what he is expressing, his statement at a specific time. I can rephrase that, Your Honor. In early 2019, did Fotis express an intention to be competing with his children again? Object, is that January? Is that February? Object on time, it's a vague well, the question. the question is in 2019. So the court is going to overrule the objection. You can answer that. He was expecting to get his kids back into skiing and be, being able to spend more time at the pond and skiing with them again. He did not mention competitions. Do you recall when in 2019 that was? Um, that was that Thursday night. And when you say that Thursday night, was that May 23rd, 2019? Yes. Uh, can you tell the jury about his demeanor or attitude towards um, that expectation? Um, I, I mean, it was, when Fotis and I talk, 90% of our conversation is water skiing. We just, that's, we never did business together, really. We never had any outside life other than water skiing. Um, he was, Definitely devastated when he didn't have his kids skiing. So I think he was excited that he was making progress and he felt like he was making progress. And he definitely said he thought he would have them at the pond a lot more. Prior years, he didn't have them down there at all. And <clears throat> I, think, I think he thought he was gonna be able to get shared custody and be able to spend weekends with them skiing and even you know, sometimes during the week. And I think that that's a, what he was hoping for. Okay, and that was around May 23rd, 2019. I want to talk about May 23rd, 2019 because, um, well, can you tell the jury if you, you saw Fotis Dulos on May 23rd, 2019? I did. Can you tell the jury a little bit about uh, those circumstances? Dinner. We were uh, invited to his house uh, for, I wouldn't call it a dinner party, just a there was six of us, um, just a, you know, a gathering, nothing formal. Just, and it wasn't last minute. We probably talked about it a couple of days earlier, and um, we met him. We went over to their house for dinner. Who were the six people who were in attendance at? Is this Fort Jefferson? 
Yes. Who were in attendance at Fort Jefferson on May 23rd, 2019. My wife and I, um, a local realtor, Stefan and his wife, Beth, and Michelle and Fotis. <clears throat> and your wife's name is? Erin. Do you remember what time you got there that night? I honestly, I don't. I'm guess. I think it was somewhere around six thirty. My guess. Do you remember what you ate for dinner? Um. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was chicken. It was a Greek salad, maybe French fries. It definitely had a bottle of wine. Uh, do you remember Fotis stepping out at any point in time in the evening? I do not. When you saw um, Fotis that night on May 23rd, 2019, do you recall whether his hair was short or long or? I think it was short. And had you ever seen him before in previous years with a very short haircut? Sure. And did um, people at the ski club often have short haircuts? Yeah, we have a couple members in our ski club who would shave their head, not shave their head, but definitely cut it way back for the summer, just. Were you surprised at all about his haircut? Um, not really. It was, I mean, going from long to short is always a different look, but I wasn't surprised. I didn't think anything of it. And. Was anything unusual about that dinner? No. Even looking back in hindsight, was there anything unusual about that dinner? No. You talked a little bit about Fotis's mood. Did he seem happy? Um, yeah, it was just, I mean, I, happy. He wasn't, I mean, he wasn't, he was, very friendly, you know, we hung out, it was very relaxed. There was nothing odd about it whatsoever. Even it, now looking back all those- Even now looking back. In hindsight. Yes. Um, do you know what time, do you recall time you left that evening? I'm guessing it was somewhere close to 10 o'clock. Do you know whether you left before or after uh, you said Stefan and Beth? Mm -hmm. I, f I feel like I left before um, they did. And the reason I think that is because I remember walking out and seeing a nice car in the driveway and saying, real estate must be good. <laughs> is, is Stefan in real estate? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall leaving of your own accord or was anybody wrapping up the dinner? No, I think, no. After you left, so that's May 23rd, 2019. Um, did Erin leave her purse at the, uh, at the house? Yes. Can you tell the jury a little bit about the circumstances surrounding how you find, found that out and, and what happened next? Um, we drove home and I think when we got home, Erin realized that she had forgotten her purse and um, instead of, she wasn't overly worried about it. Instead of, it wasn't like at a restaurant, it was in somebody's house. And um, I don't remember whether she, I, I feel like she may have texted Michelle that night and said, I forgot the purse. It might have been the next morning. She may have, may have been the next morning. I don't remember. And did, how did the purse get, was the purse eventually returned to your wife? Um, they had texted between themselves and arranged to have Michelle drop it off in my office, um, which she came by and handed me the purse. Um, do you know, when you say she came by the office, is that at the pond? Yeah, it's in front of the pond. I owned a business there, a self-storage facility with an office up front. So it was my place of work. So I was working and she just walked in and hand, handed the purse. All right, do you know if she handed the purse directly to you? Or she to did. Okay. 
Do you recall talking to her at all when she came to? It was very brief. Um, I, I feel like she was going to the grocery store, mentioned on my way to the grocery store, but it was a 10 second conversation, not even. Was there, any, was there anything unusual about her demeanor at the time? No. Even looking back in hindsight? No. Um, so that weekend, that, that was Memorial Day weekend, at, at some point uh, you learned that Jennifer was missing. Mm -hmm. And at any point in time that weekend, did Michelle or Fotis come to the ski club? Um, we did not see them set. Saturday, but um, I saw Michelle at the pond pretty much all day on that Sunday. I believe Fotis was going to see his kids or try to see his kids Sunday, so he was not there. Um, Michelle spent the day at the pond with her daughter, and then Fotis, um, I think later, it was probably late afternoon, early evening, showed up at the pond. And can you tell the jury a little bit about what Michelle's demeanor was like on that Sunday at the pond? So I believe <clears throat> there was state police at, at her house. I don't know whether they were in the house or parked out in front, but I know um, she didn't want to be there. Um, so she was obviously agitated. Um, I remember she tried to ski. I mean, the water was still very cold, but she was... Um, she was upset and she was definitely teary-eyed. And you said Fotis came later in the evening? Yep, Fotis, um, I don't think he was able to see his kids, so I think uh, he ended up back at our place, or back at the pond. Um, I would say sometime, it was later, maybe 5.30, 6 o'clock. Did Fotis, when he came, seem upset or concerned? Um, he was upset that he didn't see his kids, for sure. Um, yeah, he was upset. But that was your impression, that that's what he was upset about? I feel about? like he was upset that he didn't, yeah. He wasn't able to see his kids. During um, that weekend and the days that followed, was there a lot of media presence at the pond? Um, yes. It was unbelievable. Was there a police presence at the pond? Um, there was heavy everything at the pond. So we had, um, <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, it was nonstop. So you have podcasters calling, you have reporters driving in, calling, um, the state police, you know, showing up at my office to look at surveillance. Um, our, the pond, our pond is... It's sacred ground to us. We have 30 people in our club that love that place. And the state police come in with dogs, and they search the place with dogs. And then they put a boat in the water, and they go over the whole pond with a boat looking for a body. It was awful. And it, it obviously still is upsetting for it, you. Yeah, no. It was it was probably one of the most painful, painful times of my life. Um, and they searched your property pretty thoroughly? Yep, I gave, <clears throat> the state police came down early in the week and I gave, um, I gave a tour and showed somebody and told them all about the, the pond. And then I feel like it was a couple days later, they got a search warrant and they came down with dogs and taped off the whole place. and. There had to have been 20 police officers just doing their search in the whole place. And then, I don't know if it was a couple weeks later or it was when it was, but they came and did it again, this time with a boat, to put a boat in the water. And you cooperated fully with that? Absolutely. Investigation. Um, did, you, did you speak to um, Fotis around that time? <clears throat> The only real contact, I mean, around, around, so, yeah, I mean, we, during that week, no, I didn't see him at all. In, in May of 2019, do you remember, um, 
Fotis ever saying something to you about Jennifer having left in the past and he expected that Objection. she would show up? Effect on the hero listener, Your Honor. Well, it, then it's court, irrelevant. The, the, well, this is not going to be a street corner argument. The court knows of no exception to the hearsay rule effect on the hearer. In this court's view, that's folklore. That's not the law. Then existing emotional or mental condition is an exception to the hearsay rule. This is not being offered, as the court understands it, for the truth of the matter asserted. Overruled. You can answer that question. So Fotis would look at me and over and over the few times I saw him, he would say, I did not do this. I did not do this. And um, he did at one time tell me that Jennifer had run away at some point earlier in her life. And I don't know the details of it. And he said, she's doing it again. I have one moment, please, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Thank you. Your cross examination, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good. Uh, my name is Michelle Manning. I represent the state. I'm going to ask you a couple questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, briefly, you talked a lot about on direct about you on the pond. Yes. Okay. And uh, that's a, the ski club. What is the ski club called? Old Farm Skiers. Okay. And it's members only? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. And Photosoulis was part of that water ski membership. Yes. Correct? Okay. And Michelle Traconis was as well. Yes. And now you also own the storage facility that's around that pond. Yes. Okay. Did. And, and um, with respect to uh, water skiing is important to you, correct? Yes. Yeah. You've been doing it a very, very long time, yes. correct? Okay. So, I mean, you own a pond. You, I think you described everybody as a community, yes. would you say? Okay. And uh, Michelle Traconis was part of that community, wasn't she? Yes. And in fact, you talk about many times that you would just hang out on the dock, maybe have dinner together, things like that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you would talk to her a lot during the time she was there, correct? Um, You'd socialize. We'd so. socialize, but in a group. In a group? Um, yeah. yeah. In, like, in English? Yes. Okay. And uh, I want to ask you some specific questions about the party on May 23rd. Um, you were, it was planned a couple days in advance. That was your testimony, correct? I think so, yes. Okay. And you've had, uh, uh, you didn't know that Stefan Reich and Beth Johnson were going to be there that day in advance, did you? I feel like I did. You feel like you did? Yeah, I, I think there was going to be six of us, yes. Okay. Uh, did you, was Stefan Reich part of the water ski club? No. Okay, and Beth Johnson wasn't either? No. Okay. That was, honestly, that was the first time we met them. That was the first meeting that night? Okay. And you were invited by Photos Dulos? Yes. Okay. And I... Uh, you got there, I think you testified around 6.30? I'm guessing, I don't know. I just don't remember exactly well, what time. It's been about five years, you would say? <laughs> that fair to yep. say? Yes. Okay, and when this first happened, there was a lot of media attention. Yes. I think you talked a little bit about it. You mentioned this was a very difficult, I think your words were, this was the hardest thing that you've ever gone through in mm -hmm. your life? Yes. Was the media attention? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, by the way, you see the camera behind me? Yes. And it's been, have you, have you been watching on TV? No, haven't seen a single second of it. Okay, but have you noticed the news reports? No, I won't watch it. You won't watch it at all, mm -hmm. right? Because you're very close to Fotis. Yep. Okay, well, it's a very, very big part of your life for, I think you said, 30 years. Yes. Yeah, okay. Now, at the dinner party that night, um, the um, kind of impromptu dinner party, you'd say, right? It wasn't very formal? No. Right. Okay. It was you, your wife? Yes. Okay. And um, Stefan Reich, correct? Yes. Uh, Beth, I think she was Johnson at the time. Yep. Yeah. 
and uh, Michelle Traconis and Photos Dulos, correct? Right. Okay. And I think you testified that there was nothing odd about it. Those were your words, correct? That's correct. Okay. But Photos talked about the fact that he really wanted, couldn't wait to get that. He had an expectation he was going to get the kids again, right? Is that correct? He, yes. And he talked about, I think you testified, you talked about the fact that, you know, on May 23rd, he uh, was excited he was going to take the kids water skiing again. I think those were, that's what you said too, right? I, I, yes, he was, he said he was making progress where never before has he been making progress to get them, to never. get custody or to get visitation. Never before? That's, you remember him saying that? R repeat that. Um, you said he's been making progress where never before he's Well, been... he, up to that point, I don't think he really had the kids at all. Okay. And not even, I mean, he would, he would be able to see them once in a while, but it wasn't, it wasn't very consistent. And on May 23rd, he He mentioned said... that he thought he would be able to get more visitation and that we might be seeing the kids at the pond where we haven't in a long time. Did you discuss the plans to murder Jennifer the next morning at the dinner party? Did say that again? Did you discuss the plans with, did Fotis Dulos discuss and Michelle Draconis discuss the plans to murder Jennifer at the dinner party on the 23rd? No. Did they discuss with you at the dinner party to dispose of evidence of the murder in the garbage cans of Albany Objection. Avenue? No. Wow. Argumentative. Well, the question is essentially, the leading question that does it was the intent to murder Jennifer Dulos discussed at the dinner party. And your objection is it's argumentative. Well, the clear answer from this witness is going to be no. So the objection's overruled. Did you have those discussions, sir? No. And uh, what about the plan to use the Tacoma and clean it afterwards? Did he discuss to, that? To what? To use the Toyota Tacoma and then clean it afterwards. Did he discuss that with you? No. And uh, let's be clear. You talked a lot about the um, media influence on the pond and how the police coming with, uh, I think, it, did you say it, uh, they searched the pond one day mm -hmm. and then they came back with a boat? Mm -hmm. And divers, did they do that? Okay. And um, that was the, wor again, the worst experience of your life, them searching for- It was an awful experience. It was an awful experience. Yes, <clears throat> awful experience searching. The whole thing's an awful experience. Of yes. course. Uh, you watching the pond being searched for a uh, dead body of a mother of five was awful for you. Um, we understand that. Your... Sustained. And nothing further, Your Honor. I have a few follow-up questions. Yes. Um, the state had asked you about speaking to uh, Michelle Traconis, and she spoke English, correct? That's correct. Did she sometimes struggle to find the right word? Sometimes. Right. Um, and she would, she would ask what certain things meant? Yes. And the state had asked you about um, FOTUS's communications about making progress. Uh, were you aware at the time that a uh, custody report had come out? Objection. Sustained. Uh, did Fotis talk um, specifically about court proceedings in terms of making progress? Objection. Well, did he talk about it? The answer is either yes or no. The witness does not remember, so that's overruled. Do you want me to re-ask that? Yeah. Um, when you had mentioned that Photostoulos was talking about making progress. Was that in the context of the custody proceedings in court? Yes. And the state asked you some questions if you were part of some plan to do something nefarious, and you had said no. No. Um, you've known Fotis for decades. Yes. Right? Um, and even in hindsight, looking back, uh, there was nothing to alert you to the fact at the time, right? No. no. Nothing at all? No. No further questions. Nothing further, thank you. Mr. Haynes, you may step down.
Is there another defense witness available at this time? Yes, we won't get done with that witness, but we can certainly start unless the court wishes. I figure we should start. We have, and I've had Attorney Felsen is, I think, bringing him in at this point. Stephen Reich, S T E P H E N R E I C H. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Reich. Good afternoon. Would you please uh, indicate to the members of the jury what you do for a living? Uh, I'm a real estate agent with uh, Coldwell Banker in Avon, Connecticut. Where do you live? Avon, Connecticut. With whom? Uh, my fiance, Beth, Beth Reich. How long have you been a real estate agent? Since 2009. Can you tell the, uh, the jury a little bit about what kind of real estate, uh, there's different kinds of real estate agents, right? Yeah, you have commercial, residential. Yeah. So I, I worked primarily uh, residential, uh, new construction, um, land acquisition for building, um, luxury properties, and that's most of what it was. What area, uh, is it mostly in Connecticut? Yes, mostly the Farmington Valley of Connecticut. So Avon, Farmington, Simsbury, West Hartford, you know. Can you tell me whether or not uh, you knew Fotis Dulos? I did, yes. Did you know Michelle Traconis? I did, yes. How did you get to know Fotis Dulos? Uh, I actually met Jennifer uh, while she was walking the first set of twins, uh, Petros and Theodore, um, at the development they lived in Canton and Griswold Farms. I lived there as well. I met Jennifer while walking the dog a few times and seeing her around the neighborhood. And for the record, when you say Jennifer, who are we talking about? What's the full name? Jennifer Dulos, Jennifer Farber Dulos. And at the time you met Jennifer Dulos, was she married to Fotis Dulos? Yes, she was. Did you become, uh, could you just tell us whether or not you had a friendly or unfriendly relationship with the Duloses back then when you met Jennifer? No, very, very friendly. Can you just describe briefly, uh, uh, you said you, you met Jennifer when she was walking her twins in a stroller? In a stroller, correct. Could you just describe in a little bit, did you have a conversation to see her? What did you do? I saw her. We just, you know, started a conversation. You know, they were new to the neighborhood. I was new to the neighborhood. I moved from New York. We just, you know, kind of hit it off, just having general conversation. I had seen her subsequently a few times while she was, you know, she would walk the babies in the strollers quite often. And she had suggested that we come over to their house uh, with my ex-wife at the time to just have a drink and get to know each other. And did you do that? Yes, we did. Approximately what year was that, if you recall? Oof. Um, I would say probably 2008. How far away did you live from the Duloses back then? Less than a half a mile. Was just, it the same neighborhood or just was, on the same road? The same subdivision, same neighborhood. They were. We were on one street, they were on the next next street over, down the road. Did you also uh, develop a um, social relationship with Fotis Dulos, other than just going there once for drink? Yes. How would you describe the, um, the relationship as it developed over the next few years? The relationship between whom? Between the, well, let's, maybe I should separate them. Between you and Jennifer Dulos and you and Fotis Dulos during that time. Uh, we had gone out to dinner several times. I mean, we just, you know, would mostly go out to dinner and socialize. Um, and, you know, we'd always talk. And I was transitioning work-wise from a family business. And Fotis had suggested that, you know, I possibly get my real estate license and do sales and marketing uh, for his company. 
Did you go into real estate and get your license because of Fotis Doulis's suggestion? I did, yes. Could you tell us what was the uh, employment of Mr. Doulos at that time when he made that suggestion to you? What did Fotis do for a living? Is yes. that the question? Yeah. Uh, he owned a company called Four Group, which was you know a higher end uh, luxury home builder in the Farmington Valley. And when you got your real estate license, did you have any uh, professional dealings with the Ford Group? Once I got the license, I obtained all of the listings that the Ford Group had. And would that indicate that you were you made you had income from and through the Ford Group? Correct. Not During exclusive. that time frame, did you continue to maintain a social relationship with both Jennifer Dulos and Ford Dulos? <clears throat> yes. Do you water ski? Uh, I have. I am not a water skier. Uh, I snow ski, but uh, I have water skied with them, uh, I think maybe three times, uh, but that's just not, not really my thing. So when you say with them, did Jennifer Dulos during that time frame water ski? I water skied at the pond, I believe, two times with Fotis at the pond in Avon, and then I did water ski with Fotis and Jennifer in Greece when we were there for Clay and Noel's baptism. So uh, do you know what year that baptism would have been of Noel? She was the youngest daughter, correct? She was the youngest one, yes. Do you remember I, approximately I, what I, year that I was? I don't remember the exact year. What were the circumstances of you being in Greece at the same time as the Doulos's back then? They invited us to go there for the, for the baby's christening and to have a vacation. Where were you water skiing with, with the two of them? Um, I don't know. It was an area where Fotis had skied kind of growing up, and we skied with some friends of his, and Jennifer was on the boat, and, and she skied as well. Do you recall whether or not Fotis Doulos was involved in any competitive water skiing activities during that time where he'd actually compete? He was, yes. Did you ever observe or go to a, I don't know if it's called a tournament or a meet? I don't believe I've been to a competition. I mean, I have seen him ski at the pond, you know, a couple times, but I, I don't know if that was a competition per se. Did you ever observe any medals or ribbons or any other certificates he got as in his competitions? Yes, I've, I've seen that. Where did you see them? Uh, probably Facebook post or, you know, after an event, he would tell us how he did. Were you, you have how many children? I have one child, one biological child. Was your child of similar age to any of the Dulos children? Uh, my child was the same age as the second set of twins. And for the record, how old is your child now? 15. Did your child go to school with any of the Dulos children? Yes. Where was that? Uh, the Farmington Valley Academy, Montessori, and Avon. Did their uh, come a point when the Dulos is moved from your neighborhood to another neighborhood? Yes. Do you recall when that was? Um, I, I don't remember the exact date, no. Were you uh, at the time working for a real estate company or were you on your own? No, that? working for a real estate company. I started with William Ravis from when I got my license, I think 2009 to 2017, and then I've been with Coldwell Banker since. Did there come a separate time when you went to work for the poor group as an employee? That is correct. I still maintained my real estate license, but I, uh, it's, I was not a 1099 with four group at, at one point. I was uh, a salaried employee. When you say 1099, if you're a real estate agent, do you, how do you earn money if you're selling property uh, through a, that's being built by a, a builder? You're earning commissions, and then you're getting a 1099 from the broker at the end of the year. Tell the jury about your employment at Ford Group, where you actually were a uh, you were salaried. Correct. Could you just tell the jury how that came about? Um, Fotis did not like the fact that I was earning a lot of money in commission on the sale of some of the properties. So he wanted to bring everybody in-house and then kind of share in you know, some of the commission proceeds. So uh, I kind of still did the same thing, but my role was maybe expanded to do more you know, sales and marketing for the company and working with architects um, you know, down in the Fairfield County area to try to uh, have four group included 
uh, in bids for custom homes. You said you didn't like that you were earning so much money. Uh, during this time period, uh, what was the usual commission that you would earn for the sale of a home? It, it depends. It, it's, it's a percentage of the sale of the home, but it was it was more not outside of four group, but you know the homes that four group sold. Some of them were millions of dollars, and you know the commission numbers added up. And you know, four group didn't participate in in that money. That money came to me. I believe I earned it. I worked hard to sell those properties. Right, but if, but if the if the real estate commission was based on the price that the house sold, is that correct? Correct. You would earn more money if the house was more expensive. Correct. Yes. Did the Ford Group tend to build expensive homes? Yes. How long or what years did you work as an employee for the Ford Group? I believe 2014, sometime in the year till probably January 2017. During the time you worked there, what was your actual responsibility and job? Sales and marketing of the existing homes that we had, maybe speculative homes, uh, marketing of homes that were, quote, to be built. Well, these were paper listings that we would um, sell a land build package to a potential client. Um, I'd help out with renovations that the four group was doing, uh, land acquisition, um, working with the municipalities to subdivide land, so working with the town, working with planning and zoning, you know, what, whatever, whatever was needed. Was there a difference between a custom built home and a speculative home, as you just put it? Yes, a custom home is some a home we're building for a specific customer that you know they've given deposits and it's their home, versus a speculative home where the company, Four Group, is putting up the money in hopes of of selling it as quickly as possible, preferably during the time of construction, so that the carry cost would be minimal to the company. During the time that uh, speculative homes were being built, what was your role while you were an employee? Well, there were speculative homes, custom homes, like the role never changed regardless of you know, what homes were being built. I see. Did you meet with prospective buyers yourself during that time? I did, yes. Not by myself, but mostly with, with FOTUS together, FOTUS and I. Do you know when you stopped working for the Ford Group? I believe it was January, end of December, January 2017. Well, let me end of December of 2017 or the end of? No, it was either the December 2016, January 2017. Could you indicate to the jury, what were the circumstances for you leaving the board group? Uh, he terminated me. Can you tell them why? Um, he wanted all the employees to sign a non-compete agreement. And the non-compete agreement was like, it was just beyond the pale of what it should be. It was incredibly restrictive. Um, maybe, maybe the jurors know what it is, but maybe you can just explain what a non-compete agreement is or was in your case. It basically said, I'm an at-will employee, so Fortis can terminate me at any point, and if I would have signed the non-compete, um, the way it was written, it basically prevented me from being a realtor. It prevented me from um, using any subcontractor the four group used. It prevented me from using any architect that four group used, and it prevented me from contacting any client. And a lot of those clients were my clients that I brought to the four group. So it was just, I had heard it was not enforceable because of the language, but at a principle, I just was not prepared to sign it. And how did you find out you were being terminated? Uh, Fotis wanted everybody to sign it. He said, if you don't sign it by Monday, don't show up for work. And I didn't show up for work. Did it change your relationship with Mr. Dulos for you to be terminated under those circumstances? It, it certainly did. It certainly changed you know, the, the business component of it because I lost a lot of the listings, not all of them. I think I had like one or two of the multiple ones that were out there. Um, so yeah, it, it had an impact. During the time just before uh, you left or were told not to come in in the December of 2016 or 
early January of 2017. Uh, were you still in touch with Jennifer uh, Dulos? Um, I don't know if I was in touch with her. Most of the social interaction was when we were like visiting with both of them together, like going out or if they had an event at the house that we would go to. So I didn't see her on her own outside of FOTUS. Um, yeah, maybe saw her at the grocery store or whatever and you know, give her a hug and a kiss and say hi or, or see her at the school. Um, but it was mostly the relationship was with both of them. Did you continue to socialize with the Duloses while you were an employee? While I was an employee, yes. yes. Inclu including going out to dinner and showing up to at events and yeah, parties. Yeah, we went. I mean, we went on vacations together. We went to dinner together. They had events at their house. Uh, we had an awards thing for home builders that we would go to every year. How would you describe while you're an employee? The, the relationship that you observed between Jennifer and Fotis Duos? It was positive. I mean, we'd go out to dinner, they would sit very closely together, they would always share an entree, um, but it seemed like it was a good relationship. Did you become aware at one point that uh, Jennifer uh, had moved out? I, I did. <clears throat> and how did you find out about that? Um, I think I think Fotis told me. I, I don't remember exactly, but. When she moved to New Canaan, I, I found out about it. Did you uh, have any reason to believe that that was going to occur before she moved out? But can you repeat that? Yes. Did you have any inkling that Jennifer Doulos had planned to move out before you found out she actually had? No. <clears throat> Did you have any contact with um, Jennifer Doulos after she moved to New Canaan? Uh, I did after Hillier died. I, I reached out to her to express my because he was a... Uh, after who died? After her father, Hilliard, passed away. And what was the nature? Just describe the... I don't need the substance, but what was, how was that in terms of the... Was it cordial? Oh, was yeah, it, it was very cordial. I just said, you know, I'm so sorry for the loss of your father. He was a great man. He, he helped, you know, the company very much. I've met him many times, and I thought he was an amazing person, and I was sorry. And how long was that conversation? Um, I don't remember. After you stopped working for the company, did it? Did you still have a business relationship? I still had a business relationship. He gave most of the listings to a couple other agents in the area, um, and then over time, um, the listings started coming coming back to me. Same kind of um, home, same kind of construction? Yes, correct. Same just under, under a different dynamic that it was just, you know, I'm representing him as a realtor. There was no other relationship, uh, and that was it. Back to getting a 1099 in a commission? Correct, yep. Your Honor, um, I'm going to move on to another subject. Perhaps this might be a good place to break. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will resume the session at 2 o'clock. Uh, please do not discuss the case. Am I free to get it?